to turn things up. So I just want to say thank you to you guys for coming out for this experiment in connection during these times of stay-at-home orders. We have one here in Illinois. We're actually um, not allowed to go out unless we got something essential. But I want to thank um, Clarence, who I don't know if on the line, who invited me, one of your professors, and definitely Karen and Skip for um, helping to arrange this remote lecture. And to Christina and Jenny, um, who have been coordinating um, the talk and um, some visits I'm going to do with some um, graduate students uh, tomorrow morning and afternoon. Um, so thank you. So I'm going to, uh, let's see. Uh, first, I have to share my screen, so bear with me. I apologize in advance if my dog starts to bark because he sees, he hears somebody outside, but hopefully um, he'll be chilled out. Okay. Okay, sharing my screen and I'm gonna start to play. So this first little bit, if the sound is too loud for you, you'll, you can um, turn it down. I've turned it down on my end here. Um, this first little bit here, oh, some audio and video from a project that I'm gonna talk about a little later, but I just thought I'd start with it. The video is manipulated video from a NASA archive, and the audio is something I commissioned from a sound artist um, named Joelle Mercedes here in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. It's doing it again. I'm gonna have to stop this, hold on. Uh, I have to stop my share for a moment. It's doing this funny thing it did in our rehearsal. And I'm gonna go, hold on. I'm gonna share again. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, I'm gonna start with these diagrams that kind of explain my creative spheres of plaque. Uh, practice. Um, in the introduction, you heard I'm an artist, designer. I use designer and maker uh, simultaneously, a writer and a curator. In terms of uh, the artist sphere, the creative sphere, and um, as an educator and a college administrator, my practice, I consider education and my teaching as a practice also, because I feel as though I'm a co-learner in my classroom, along with my students who are learning from me and each other. And then in my personal practice is a very grounded in a spiritual practice. Um, I've been a meditator since I was a teenager, which is many years ago. And when I look at the space where all of those things connect, it's uh, in a spiritually placed value system that strives to increase human potential for um, common good. And all of these practices are fluid and dynamic and they continue. And there's never a point where I feel like I get to some place where anything is finished or done. I thought I'd start my talk where my uh, creative practice and my educational practice kind of overlap which starts with a love of history. So I'm gonna start from where I am right now. I live in Chicago in a neighborhood, a historic neighborhood called Pullman. And I did a little video, which you'll see on the bottom right, it was snowing on Sunday, although it was like 55 degrees today, it was snowing on uh, Sunday. And Pullman, is at the epicenter of labor history in the United States. It uh, was designated, I think, in 2011 or 12 by Obama, who was our president then, remember him, um, as a historic neighborhood. 
So down in the bottom where it's snowing, that's looking out from my house to my neighborhood. So all of the buildings are, um, were built in the late 1800s as a um, kind of model utopian neighborhood by George Pullman, who built a railroad company. Some of you may be um, familiar with the Pullman Porters, who are African-American men. You can see them on the bottom left. And the, um, in about 1894, when the, um, there was a depression that was happening in the country, and George Pullman, who actually had his workers live in this community and pay him rent, as well as work for him, in the depression, he did not allow, um, he did not reduce the rents. Uh, about 4,000 workers struck. And to make a long story short, because I don't have a lot of time, um, to appease the workers after the strike ended, the president at the time, Grover Cleveland, created Labor Day. So Labor Day starts in my neighborhood um, here in Chicago. And um, one really important person, Eugene Debs, which started the first socialist party here in the United States, was... Um, of our, one of our presidential candidates, Bernie Sanders, his ideology is very influenced by um, Eugene Debs. So if you were to look up Bernie a little deeper, those of you that are interested in him, you would find that some of his socialist ideas come from Eugene Debs and some of the labor um, practices that he first instituted here in my city in Pullman um, spreads throughout the country. So to continue with ideas of history, I'm gonna to talk to you about three projects. The first project is called Eliza's Peculiar Cabinet of Curiosities. It is in the Linden Sculpture Garden in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, the installation opened 2016 and it is still there. It's a kind of semi-permanent installation that is open seasonally from April through about November every year. Um, it started with quite a bit of research. One of my benefactors or supporters of this project, the Chipstone Foundation, they are, um, uh, they have a, a pretty large decorative arts collection that is both historical and contemporary. They were a major funder in my project and supported my research as well as the production. So you're looking at Charleston, where I went to do some research on slave cabins. And these are just some of the research I did and some of the pictures that I took at some of them that still exist in the country. And I also wanted to do research on what it would be like for uh, enslaved person at this time. What would be their life like? I mean, we know that slavery was an awful, horrific Holocaust. But in between those moments of um, what it might have been like for Africans that had been brought to this country, what were some of the other things that we don't know? Uh, this project imagines a 19th century African American woman or African woman that is fictional. And her, I use the cabin as her cabinet of curiosities in terms of how she looked at the culture that she was experiencing, her collection, and you'll see collections is a theme in a lot of my work, um, and what that might have been like. So my first um, step was to do research on what enslaved life was like, and I was fortunate enough to be sent to Charleston along with one of the Chipstone curators and a fabricator who was going to be working with me. What you're looking at now is the main house for the Linden Sculpture Garden in Milwaukee, where the work lives. It was, um, the Sculpture Garden collection was a collection of the wife of an industrialist that wanted her own private collection of mid-century sculpture. So if you can imagine, she had people like Osama Noguchi, David Smith, Barbara Hepworth, um, and there are about 40 acres of land that she put um, these sculptures on. And then after she died, 
she opened it as a foundation, the family opened it as a foundation and um, they became a sculpture park that you could visit and take your own guided tour with. So in thinking about where to put this work, you know, was it going to be in conversation with mid-century sculpture or was it going to be uh, somewhere else? So we, we were walking around the grounds and found this space here on the east end and felt like it was the perfect place to put the cabin. So just to give you a little idea of how a project like this came together, um, I started making drawings and then from my drawings I made um, scale models and this is in the uh, workshop of the fabricator. Uh, the show opened in um, late spring, early summer. So we had to build this within his studio. So I was smart enough to make sure to ask how high his ceilings were so that I could design something that was going to fit. Um, so you can see some of the black and white pictures inside and um, the way we made it is modular so we could take it apart and then transport it to the sculpture part. But you can see I wasn't smart enough to make sure his door was big enough so that we can get all the walls out. So as we were packing things up and getting things out, one of our walls <laughs> didn't fit. So we had to cut it and open, ask the, um, his mate um, next door to open his door so that we could get it out. I've learned a lot of things working on this project, as you could see, about how to do things. So here it is on the truck. Um, getting ready to go to the Linden Sculpture Garden. And here we are taking some of the walls and ceilings and preparing the imagery that goes on them. Um, we wheat pasted a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation on the ceiling. And there's some students are helping me wheat paste the ceiling. And on the right, you could see the folks that made the vinyl since it was going to be outside. We wanted to be able to, we wanted it to be able to live for a long time. So we, we transferred some of the imagery that was inside on vinyl. And that image on the right is one of the pictures I took in my research in um, Charleston. So here they are um, having a little bit of a problem trying to fit everything. The fabricator Brent is on the ladder um, and the guys that work at the Linden are trying to help get all of the pieces together um, to install it on site. This is Nick Mathis. So we were on the very, very far end of the garden, which had no electricity whatsoever. So the way that since there's media, there's actually video that's running inside the cabin, even though it has a 19th century reference, the character, as I'll talk about a little later, is a shapeshifter. She spans and travels over different time periods. So um, there's some video in there and we, um, Nick Mathis, I think is this wizard that that instrument that he has down there can tell him where the sun is going to be at any time of the year and can tell him what kind of power is necessary um, and how much he'll need for the solar panel that you see there on the left. So um, that got installed and we had to dig a trench from the solar panel all the way to the cabin to run some of the um, media that's um, in there. And here's another picture before we painted the cabin where um, um, putting things together simultaneously as they're finishing things, I'm installing things inside. So it, now it's open in the summer. So if you're walking to the cabin, you're going to walk through a big, tall, um, landscape of prairie grass till you get there. And um, this is the cabin. We um, mowed a lot of the prairie grass around it, but it does sit inside a natural environment. Um, the way that I have it is some of the um, objects from uh, Liza, who's the fictional character, are in bell jars in a kind of a display area from a place that has a fallen wall that's open. 
And you could see, here's another view. And then this is the inside. Um, I fell in love with this picture that you see on the wall facing you. And I, I found it before I actually knew what it was or who they were. Um, and it turns out it was, uh, the gentleman is from Jamaica. He was a free uh, man, free black man at that time. He married a woman and bought her freedom. That's his wife. His wife happens to be named America. And serendipitously, uh, to go with my ceiling of the Emancipation Proclamation, they were married on that day that proclamation was signed. This is all serendipitous. I did not know this. I fell in love with the picture before I did the research on it and figured out what it was. Um, so there's a lot of water references in the cabin. The bucket that you see on the left looks like a bucket that might hold water, and it does, except it's dynamic. It's video of the Mississippi River. When I was first conceiving this project, I wanted to have, I wanted when you walked into the cabin that you walked on a floor of water, but I did not have the resources nor the technology or the, the wherewithal to understand how to make technology that could do that outside. Something that could be done inside pretty easily, but outside it's not so easy. So I um, decided that I was going to put touches of water in different places. So if you walk up to the bucket, there is dynamic water. And also um, there's other places where there's water. Um, you can see some of Eliza's collection, her potions in the left, some silverware, uh, a baby shoe. Um, and here, so this, this video that you see here of people doing what's called a ring shout, this is visible right here at the bottom in this little square. Um, so you have to lean down to see it. But at that time, it was not legal for Black people to dance. So when you have a legal precedent like that, you have to define, well, what does dance mean? So it was defined in the South as any kind of physical movement where you cross your feet. So this dance of doing a ring shout, which is kind of um, creating rhythm on floorboards, is done without the crossing of feet so that it could be legal. Um, so that comes from the um, Smithsonian collection. Um, and then you could see here, if you look up at the ladder that goes through the, the, the cabin, when you look up, you see water again um, playing that, with, that represents the um, Atlantic Ocean as symbolism for the Middle Passage. Um, so it displaces the water and the ocean and puts it above your head in this instance. So there's these signals in this cabin that kind of try to signal to you that there's other things going on and other things happening. There's a lot of references to hair. There's um, this, uh, this is a woodpecker here that I actually found in my driveway. It had, was migrating and um, fell and um, was trying, and I saved it and had someone embalm it for me. So these are some pictures of um, Eliza's desk and some of her library that's in her collection. Um, many of the kids that come in always ask me about um, Princess Leia. Remember that Eliza is a time traveler, so Princess Leia is a hero of hers in the future. And I'm just gonna go through some of these. Also, I decided to put her field notes from her collection in a copy of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So she writes about her, her collection and she does her own manipulations inside pages of um, this book, which would be written around the time she is imagined to have lived. Um, we did a symposium where we invited international scholars to come and um, talk about the project. For me, it was like an uber critique. 
in that the what I asked them to do was just pick an object and talk about it and what their response was to it. And then every year um, in um, Wisconsin, um, the um, Innovation Institute of the School of Education comes and they make a, um, a curriculum for K through 12 and find that this is a much easier way to, to teach elementary school kids about the, this period of history. So I'm going to move on to my second project that I'm showing you, which was at the Hyde Park Art Center and references the video and the audio that I showed you earlier. Um, the name of the show is Dark Matter, Celestial Objects as Messengers of Love in These Troubled Times. And this exhibition is inspired very much um, in an Afrofuturist context um, in looking at the past, present, and future. And it was inspired by the golden record. If, if we had an audience, I'd be asking for hands for people that know about the project of the golden record, which was produced by NASA and sent into space on both the Voyager 1 and 2 in 1977. Um, and here is the apparatus that holds this golden record that has encoded in it 155 images, sounds and recordings from Earth, from sounds of whales through Stravinsky, Chuck Berry, and um, uh, sounds from the rainforest. So I just was very inspired by this idea that this record or this communication, this object as a means of communication would be sent out to space to possible other beings. And I imagine that they kind of answered. And um, so I want to describe all the elements that are part of this um, installation. So there's these um, orbs. These are about maybe 18 inches in diameter that are hanging. The orbs are the messengers of love that come from space. And they come from space on a spaceship that, has, that is, is symbolized by the sculpture that has crashed through the ceiling. And I think of it as a, um, it's, it's kind of based on the vernacular architecture of a shotgun house. Um, and, um, it is, uh, it is what has brought these orbs uh, who are resting on um, lava rock. And the walls were painted black with glitter and mylar to activate that sense of what a starscape looks like. The floors were painted blue. Here again, my, my symbol of water again. Um, and um, the Hyde Park Art Center has this wonder in this gal in their main gallery where the exhibition was, they have this wonderful video mezzanine. So in the mezzanine is the manipulated video that I showed you that came from the NASA archive of the sun and the moon. There are five screens. So those are playing and looping while you're in there. And then at the same time, I commissioned a sound artist, Joel Mercedes, to create three different soundscapes that are placed in three different parts of the gallery space, very abstract sounds at which are recorded, original. Sometimes you can hear Nina Simone, um, they're um, playing. So when you walk through the space, you're gonna, you hear things and they're looped at different time frames. So there's never the same combination of these three soundscapes. It just, they just loop kind of on their own time. Um, so here's another view of the, um, of the mezzanine where the videos are. So you can go up there and um, uh, also look at the exhibition from up there. So what's cool about it too is that the videos also show on the outside of the building. So they would run 24 hours from the outside. We, um, even if the gallery was closed, you could still see these, the sun and the moon looping in these videoscapes. And I just thought since I'm talking to grad students, I would talk about process a little bit. You see, I had a model for the other installation. I work, I feel like that's the way I could see how things are coming together in my head. And it's also because I'm working with a team of people 
they can't understand what's in my head. They have to see it. So I like to work with scale models so that we can have conversations about how we're going to install things and how things are going to go. So that's, that's a um, scale model. And I wanted to also tell you a lot of the orbs were made at a residency I had at the Kohler um, factory. This is the studio that I had right on the factory floor there. I was there for two months where I made those orbs. Um, this is what the factory looks like. It's a ceramic factory, has no air conditioning because we're working with um, porcelain and it has to stay warm. It has to stay at a consistent temperature. Uh, this is my studio as I was working and making molds. I made more than the orbs, but um, it gets really messy in there. So I'm right on the factory floor with master um, makers who have been doing this for 30 or 40 years. So they taught me quite a bit. And I originally wanted to make really large, like three or four really large orbs, but I was experimenting and I was trying it and they were failing. So I was like, what the heck am I gonna do? So I was just walking around um, Kohler factory and you may know they make sinks and bidets and um, all kinds of ceramic things. And so I just, one day I just said, sinks, sinks, I could make, use the sinks. So um, I went upstairs where they were making a particular sink that I liked and I say, hey, can I have some of those? So for like two weeks, I would go up right when they took the um, work out of the mold at like eight, between eight and 8.30 in the morning, I would bring maybe um, uh, half a dozen pieces down. And then I would work with them, putting them together. I would manipulate them. Sometimes I'd take the collet off, sometimes I'd take the lip off. And so you're seeing some that I'm, I worked on that I'm getting ready to take to one of their huge ovens. And this is the line that they have to go into these huge ovens to bake for 10 or 12 hours. So my work is in line to go in. And here I've glazed them and they're getting ready to go into the line to be baked. And there's like a long line that takes 24 hours for it to go through the whole thing. So whenever it comes out, I had to be there whatever time of the day, I had to be there to get my things out. And the factory is huge. So to get around, you ride a bicycle because it's that big. And you can see all, all of their sinks kind of ready for production and glazing right there. So just so I want you to get an idea how big the High Park Art Center Gallery actually was and for you to understand that it, the floor was gray all the walls were white. Um, some of the walls we actually had to put back because they have garages that go outside. So we, it took us two days to paint it all black. It took us three days to put glitter and mylar on the walls. Um, so, you know, there was a team of us and we were working, but I want you to appreciate how big the space was and how much work we actually had to do to make the, the um, uh, installation to build the sculpture there wasn't really the workshop wasn't big enough so we had to build them in the gallery um, and here you see um, them being installed by one of the install we had to actually hoist them up and secure them safely to the ceiling here there's a picture um, for to to end the exhibition I got some funding to commission, um, you see uh, Krista Franklin sitting underneath the sculpture there. She's a kind of renowned poet in Chicago. And then uh, Ben Lamar Gay is a really wonderful jazz musician. So I asked her if she would uh, write a poem in response to the work. So she wrote a poem, uh, Ben um, improvised with her. We invited people to come in and actually recorded it. So we actually made an LP, we recorded an album and the album is done and we're right in the process of finishing the catalog for the show. So the catalog will have a, an album with it. There's, um, we're doing about 200 limited edition copies by, uh, produced by Candor Arts with, with, who makes catalogs by hand, kind of the old way. Um, so I'm really excited to have um, an LP 
connected to the exhibition of the catalog that will come out later this year. We're almost done, except for coronavirus stuff that's kind of in our way right now. So the last project I'm going to talk to you about is, um, so the first project had a lot to do with history and kind of reimagining history from an Afrofuturist context. This one was also from an Afro, the last one at the Hyde Park Arts Center, also from an Afrofuturist context. And this um, project, so I have a background as a designer, so I do, although I have my own artistic and visual art practice, I work collaboratively with another designer named Norman Teague, and we have a studio called Black House Studio, and that studio is devoted to using design, uh, it's very socially focused, using design to uplift and um, uh, bring agency to communities, particularly communities of color, but marginalized communities. Um, so we were invited by the um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago to do a commons artist project. They have a new area where it's you can come into the museum and it's an area you don't have to pay to get in and they have all kinds of performances and artist projects that go on there. So our project was called the Commons Table and we created and designed portable tables that we took out into the community to have dinners with different people around different themes. So the idea, so the idea of this was to ask how can museums be more thoughtful regarding the communities and their collection strategies and how might they understand that stories of personal collections that might be important to the communities that they sit in can inform and perhaps transform their own strategies of collecting and their own priorities around collecting in museum spaces. So that was kind of our challenge to the museum. Um, and so we organized five different dinners and we asked people to bring objects related to five different themes. One, the commodification of modernism, like why has that stuck so long? Nature and social justice in 21st century cities, how nature might be brought to the forefront to revive and nurture city life disability and perspective having to do with accessibility. Um, we had another dinner with about radical futures with teens. And then our final dinner was the relationships between collectors and artists. And so we um, asked people to bring objects that would become, our, become part of our commons collection. And um, we had five questions around each of the themes so the, the components of the exhibition are the five dinners, five questions, four rotating exhibitions to show some of the objects, the commons collection, a final report, which we did um, before the end of the exhibition, which ended just March 1st. And then we want to put every single person that we photographed in their object in a book and um, um, talk about the five things and what communities talked about. So the common space is a very vibrant space. It's got all these plants hanging. So you see on the right, those are the portable tables that we could take apart that we took to the dinner. You see on the left, those were displays that we also designed for um, the objects. Um, and then what we would do is we, we asked, we, so we were in different communities all around Chicago and we asked people from those communities, we chose a curator and a dinner facilitator to, to run the conversation. It wasn't us running it. We were witnesses and we were listening. Um, so we had different curators from those communities and different people leading the conversations. And we displayed the objects and we photographed them with a, a kiosk. We took photographs and we took information about who they were and what they, um, why the object was important to them. And then we displayed um, the 10 of the objects from each of the dinners with the people that brought them in the museum. And then the curator did a little, did some um, text, um, wall text, 
to talk about what we talked about at that particular dinner. Um, let's see. I think so. Um, the people, I'm going to show this little video as I end. Did pretty good. 29 minutes. All right. Um, so this, this is a little video. This is the last thing I'm showing you. And these folks are people that were at our first dinner around um, the commodification of modernism. And uh, one of the people, the first person you see will be Lynn McDaniel. She's the owner of Orange Moon and it's like a resale shop that sells modern furniture, mid-century furniture in Chicago. And some of two of the other people that are there are also, we're also from that particular dinner and they're talking about their objects and meanings of objects. Everybody collects, whether they even realize not whether it's dishes, whether it's socks. Objects are imbued with the giver, the taker, the owner. I think that the base is adding on to these like lineages of practices by black women and black makers. I was realizing that there was a moment when that world got bigger, the discovery that the world wasn't all me. Historically, I think about how I'm connected through other cultures. These objects flesh out a life that you would never know. And, and many of us find secrets after they die. I really like that particular piece because it looks like a little sculpture, almost like a little person. When you collect, you're becoming the author of your own story. It's a big connection, you know, and as human beings, that's all we want to do is connect. I think it's like super important to just always have a reflection of yourself. That's what I really want my daughter to remember. If you see something you really like, something's gonna happen in your body. We call it the catch. And it, go, it goes like this. <gasps> so I'm just putting up my website addresses since that was pretty abbreviated talk. If you wanna know more about my work, uh, fawilson.com and blackhousestudios.com. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay.